the lecture as it relates to blood. So let's go. Okay, so blood. How many liters of blood does the average person have? Ah, somebody, yes. See somebody pop the hand. Go ahead. So my hand was not for the blood how much, but I wasn't hearing you properly. The internet gave them trouble. So. Okay. Are you all hearing me any better now? So it's not you. Five liters. Oh, five liters. Oh, it's probably just um, one person not hearing me too clearly, but that is correct. We have, well, an average is five, the low number is four, right? So it's not a whole lot of blood that we do have in our bodies. That's why it's important when somebody is bleeding out or hemorrhaging, it is important to stop that blood flow. All yeah. right, let's go along and see what, what it tells us, all right? Okay. So blood is considered a liquid connective tech, um, tissue, and this has to do from an embryological perspective, right? In terms of um, developmentally, it is when you're looking at the embryo, it is derived at the same time as some of the other connective tissues within the body in terms of when it first appears. So hence the reason it is classified as a liquid connective tissue. Now, functionally, it connects various parts of the body by carrying fluids, nutrients, gases from one point to, the an to another. One of the other topics which we will be looking at when we, when we get to respiration, of course, we'll look in a little more detail how oxygen is carried from the lungs to the other portions of the body itself. And also we look at how carbon dioxide is removed from the lungs and returned to the external environment. In so doing, when you look at when you're thinking about the removal of carbon dioxide, of course, at the level of the cell, the carbon dioxide has to leave the cell and then enough get into the blood system via the capillary network and then get to the lungs via the associated blood network that goes to the lungs, the pulmonary network. So very importantly, we would look at that to see how it is then that the blood acts as a carrier for carbon dioxide leaving the body. And it's very important because when carbon dioxide builds up, of course, it could in excessive amounts be toxic to the body itself. Structurally, it contains the extracellular matrix, which is the plasma. And you will be reading more about plasma when you do have a look at the um, when you have a look at the exercise today. And of course, cells need nutrients. They do produce waste. And of course, in excessive amounts, if these wastes are not removed, the cells will die. Cells in and of themselves do have a lifespan. We know blood, for instance, has a lifespan of approximately 90 days after which it dies. Now, other cells which do not move around such as those comprising the skin, they need to be removed, else it could lead to infection developing. So it's very important that in terms of the replacement of cells, fortunately with blood, that they are replaced every 90 days or so. And this is important so that infection doesn't build up. So blood, what's some of the unique properties? Well. The cells of blood are always in constant motion. They have relatively short lifespans. It's red. Is blood ever blue? Let me ask that question. Is blood ever blue? I'll train it out. Anybody want to answer that one? Yes, so it's, um, it's, it's a darker shade of red, like a reddish blue when it deoxygenated. Right, okay, who's that? Tyrese, yes. All right, so it's a darker shade of red when it's deoxygenated but it's never blue. Now, that is important to remember. Some people think that, you know, blood could be blue, and that is not true, right? Blood, blood isn't blue at all. So it's always important to remember that. Who answered that question? That was Tyrese. That was very good there, Tyrese. Uh, yeah, so blood is never blue. 
the reason why you would see it in your in diagrams, especially when we look at the heart next week, you know, you would see it, they color it blue. They just do it for simplicity. So you would tell the difference between oxygenated blood, which is usually, which is colored red and deoxygenated blood, which is colored blue. And that's the only reason why. So you just to tell the difference between the two, but it's important to remember blood is never blue. What would you do if you see somebody with blue blood, if you cut them, uh, or if they present, let's say, in the casualty and um, let's say an incision is made and blue blood comes out, what should you do? Yes, the question is on the floor. What should you do? Anybody? What do you mean, like blue, blue or deoxygenated? Yeah, like blue, 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 like blue, the color blue. So let's they say run. you make an incision. Yeah, run, of course. Run, 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 run. Yes, <laughs> yes, run. yes, run, run, run far and run fast. But something is definitely not, you know, you don't ask questions. Blue blood, my word, this is odd. Excuse me, sir, do you know your blood is blue? No, and then he just, eat, he or she just eat you. No, it does not like that. So always remember, if you see blue blood run, because blood is never blue in terms of humanoids to the best of our knowledge and in the literature, it does not appear blue. Let's see some other properties of blood. So it's red and it's thick. It's pH is approximately 7.4. Do we know of any substances whose pH is 7? Anybody wants to hazard, I guess? What? What? It's water. 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 Very good, Miss Fuentes. Yes. Right? That's, um, right? So water has a pH of approximately 7 and considered neutral. Note that blood accounts for almost 7% of your body. That's just an interesting fact. Would you see that on a test? Hardly likely. Hardly likely. Oh, yeah, that is, that is not all that important. Let's have a look at some of the functions of blood. One, blood elements form a clot to reduce blood loss. And that is, that is very important. And the mechanism, it's a positive feedback mechanism. So if you're bleeding, more and more elements are produced to initiate and form that clot because you would want that clot to stop. You wouldn't want to lose those five liters. Five liters is not much. So it is critical that you stop that bleeding. Next, blood transfer is heat to the skin surface to be lost. For those of us who exercise, when you do exercise, one of the things you will notice is that the veins or your uh, close to the skin, they tend to uh, swell up. And the reason why they do that is that they carry, blood carries heat in the body, one of the waste products of metabolism. When glucose is broken down, you have glucose plus oxygen giving you carbon dioxide, water, and energy, but also heat is produced as a byproduct. And that heat is circulated, which is why you find that, let's say, in the night, like today, for instance, today it's rainy outside. Let's say you're lying down and you're still feeling cold. What you tend to do is shiver. Why do you shiver? Because muscle contraction, one of the byproduct in terms of utilizing that sugar to bring about contraction, it produces heat. And the heat now could get into the blood, move throughout your body, and that warms it up. That's why whenever we feel cold, you tend to shiver, right? The shivering actually brings about, it creates heat as a byproduct of muscle contraction there, okay? Okay, so the next thing is blood elements defends against microbes. That is very important. The immune system, we look at that in week four. The immune system, part of the immune system, the repository of the, of the immune system is the lymphatic system. So we will be looking at the lymphatics, very important uh, circulatory system in the body and it re the repository of it or within the lymphatics, we will find white blood cells. <laughs> Those white blood cells are very important in terms of maintenance or keeping away different attackers within the body itself. So bacterial infections and the like, white blood cells bring about their part, central part of your defense mechanism coming under the immune system. Next, we see the blood's hydraulic forces sustains urine, urine formation. When we are looking at your information, as in week five, when you're looking at the kidneys, we will see that the way the kidneys function is by pressure filtration. If you take away the pressure, psh, kidneys stop, 
all right? So that's very important to take note, right? And we will talk a little bit more of that when we speak about it in week five in terms of the functioning of the kidneys, but works by pressure filtration through the glomerulus, the basic unit, which is repeated over and over within the kidneys itself. Then, a, then major function, transport, oxygen, and nutrients, waste, and chemical messengers throughout the body, major function of the blood, uh, primarily so. All right, so what about the components? Well, if you extract blood and you put it in a centrifuge and you spin it, you will uh, realize it separates into two. It separates into erythrocytes, which are approximately 6 million per microliter. If we have 6 million per microliter, how many red blood cells do we have in a liter of blood then? Anybody wants to bring me up to speed? If we have 6 million in a microliter, how many do we have in a liter? A six with how many zeros? Um, uh, with eight zeros? Eight zeros, I was close, but not quite. Um, Answer. You're going the wrong direction, but that was a nice it guess. It's 10 microliters in one liter. Go again. No, how many zeros? If you have 6 million uh, red blood cells in a microliter, how many right. will you have in a liter? Is a six with how many zeros? Be a thousand. So you'll add, you'll add three zeros to the 6 million. <laughs> that is nine no. in all. We're still going up. We're still going up. More than nine. <laughs> You're close. Yeah, yeah. Pardon? Ten. More. Uh, so twelve. Thank you. Who said that word? Who said twelve? Uh, Who said twelve? That is the vicar? No. Sacha. Sacha, very good, Sacha. All right. So indeed it is twelve. All right. So six with, mm -hmm. with twelve zeros, or six, depending on where you're from, that is a trillion, a six trillion. So you have six trillion in a liter of blood. So therefore, since we have five liters in all, we have 30 trillion red blood cells. And let me ask you this, why is it do we have 30 trillion red blood cells in our body? One word, because carrying oxygen, the function of the blood is one okay. word, one word. Why do we have 30, 30 trillion? So why do we have 30 trillion? Because blood carrying is one word. It is, it begins with I. Important. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Who is that, Devika? Yes, yes, yes. It's important. Because if it wasn't important, we would not have all, you wouldn't, uh, invest so much, believe you me, that's a lot, right? To the trillion. So the reason why I have so many, because it is important. Usually, similarly, you know, when we look at sperm, how many billion you'd find, let's say in one, uh, in five milliliters of ejaculate. The reason why is because this is important. Reproduction is important. Reason why you have uh, 30 trillion in your red blood cells to carry oxygen and carry out the functions of the blood because it is important. What would happen if we were not able to carry oxygen around our bodies? Dot, 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 you'll be dead. So yeah. always remember, usually when you see your body, remember the body is a machine. If it invests a lot of time and effort into creating something, that's because it is very, very important. Yeah. Okay, let's go again. So the red blood cells, and then we have the white blood cells, these are all part of the immune system, the neutrophils, lymphocytes, monocytes, eosinophils, and basophils, all part of the immune system. Then we have the platelets, very important for clotting purposes. And as we mentioned, right, we don't want to hemorrhage because if you do hemorrhage, that'll be the end of the story. So if you were to take it, let's have another look here. Right, let's have another look here. So these are the components of blood. 
So if you make a blood smear, and we, we try to get some of these slides uh, when we are doing the lab, which start next week. So this is just showing the smear. And you see the red blood cells, there's a fragment, that's a platelet. You all see in the hand in the um, that, that I'm waving around? Yes, Could you all yes, see sir. it? Yes, okay, yes, great. All right, great. Just wanted to make sure I wasn't waving in vain. <laughs> waving in vain, you all get it. You know, we're doing arteries, vein, blood. Okay, let's go forward. I'm not waving in vain. So here we have the lymphocyte, neutrophils, and these are what they look like monocytes and basophils, all right? Notice how small the platelets are relative to the size of the other blood cells. What are these cells here? One of these numerous ones, what are they? So the red blood cells. Correct is right, very good. Who is that one? That was Ms. Fuentes again, good. Yes, sir. Right. So those are the, yep, those are the um, red blood cells. And notice how numerous they are relative to the others. So that is important. All right. Mm -hmm. So two major components of the blood, the plasma, which is the liquid part, and then you have the solid, solid matter, which is the cellular elements. Plasma, liquid, the cells, those are the solid matter. And the plasma is mainly water, it's 90% water, 9% protein. And the major protein you'd find in blood is a protein you find in eggs. What protein Albumen. is that one? Albumin, Albumen. very good, very good. Dorica, very good, right? So that one, you find it in eggs and it's a carrier protein. And what do we mean by carrier protein? Very similar to a maxi taxi, carries it from point A to point B. Any of the, anything within the body, particularly proteins, if they want to get from one point to another, they will look out for these albumin proteins and they will hitch a ride. You know, they tell them, hey, drive. Uh, I know you're going for us, we're not taking it short and sugar on us, right? When it reaches sugar on us, right, the protein will hop off. And that's how they move from point A to B. They move via these carrier proteins, which are present in the blood, namely albumin. All right, and if you notice here, this is the major one. Fibrinogen, they converted into fibrin and it's part of the clotting cascade. Very important there. You also have globulins and two of them are shown here. They transport iron and they're also part of, or they form antibodies. Very important for identification of the different blood types. So here we're seeing hematopoiesis of the making of the red blood cells and how, how, are, how does hematopoiesis uh, begin in terms of making of blood cells? Well, first, of course, you have, it starts from a hematopoietic stem cells. So the stem cells, these are the initiators, the hematopoietic stem cells. And from the hematopoietic stem cells, you get all the other different types of cells actually forming, right? But the originator is the hematopoietic stem cell, the pluripotent hematopoietic stem cell, that's the originator. Then it differentiates and you get all the other types of cells. All right, so let's have a look here. This is normal blood and this is some malignant leukocytes. What disease are we looking at over here in which you have these malignant leukocytes being present? What disease? Let me see, you could tell me this one. What disease is present over here? Leukemia. Leukemia. What you're saying? Very good. Who, who, who said who say leukemia? Who was the one who said it first? Uh, me, Jamie. Jamie. Well done, Jamie. All right, so. Look, I see in it right underneath. I know. I know it was <laughs> there. I was, so I wanted to see how many people were quick with their eyes or who probably knew, knew it offhand. Right, but it's written right here, leukemia. I wonder, I wonder how many people were like, hmm, I wonder where's that one, boy? I'm trying to bust the head, right? But it was right there. Let's have a look at blood cells in a little more detail. So this is a, a electron microscope, uh, scanning electron micrograph or microscopic view of a red blood cell. And what it really consists of is proteins, right? Four heme proteins, and one, two, three, four, there, he, sorry, globin proteins, and attached to them is the heme moiety. All right, so here you have four heme, one, two, three, four, and you also have four of the globins, one, two, three, four. 
And within each heme moiety, you'll find iron. So iron is an integral part of the red blood cell. And when you don't have iron present, what disease or what symptom is associated with a lack of iron when you don't have iron? Anemia. Anemia. Yes, yes very good, Tyrese. All right? You usually get anemia. That is very important to take note of. All right, so very good there, Tyrese. That's good for him. All right. Yeah, okay, good. All right, so very important there, uh, these iron. And what foods do you know are rich in iron? Anybody knows? Green. Green leafy vegetables. Green leafy vegetables, right, right. Anything else? Eggs. Eggs. Beef. Eggs, beef. All right. Anything else? Green fig. Green fig. Green liver. Yeah, boy. Green fig. Yeah, green fig. Is chicken liver. Chicken liver. Yeah. Ooh. Yeah. Yeah, chicken liver. That is true. Green fig. Green fig, yes, yes, yes. Anything else? Sort of red meat, like beef. Red, red meat, meat, like beef. Huh? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, yes. Anything else? Beetroot. Beetroot, I've heard beetroot as well. Yes, all of these things rich in iron. So it is important, you know, to include them as much as possible in your diet. Dashing bush leaf, that would come under the green leafy vegetables. Very true. All right, so these are the white blood cells that are speaking to it. Um, you wouldn't have to know uh, these are not included for the purpose of this course. Just have to know that the white blood cells, if anybody against infections, as we mentioned before. All right, inflammation is the body's collective cellular and vascular response to injury. And we look at this a little more detail when we look at blood vessels, when we look at inflammation. The erythrocytes, the red blood cells, Remember, we mentioned that the normal count is about 5,000 per microliter, and that translates into approximately uh, 25 trillion, uh, 25 or 12 zeros. That is how many we have collectively in the five liters of blood that we do have, well, normal person have. And this is showing the life cycle of a red blood cell in terms of erythrocytes. So, you do get from your diet, you get the building blocks. And within the bone marrow, the bone marrow, of course, that's the site where you do have the hematopoietic stem cells. So the bone marrow within there, you do have the formation of the red blood cells from the bone marrow itself. So that is very important to note that while you do get the nutrients, iron and so on, the components is within the bone marrow is where you have the red blood cells being formed from the pluripotent hematopoietic stem cells. Okay, now very interestingly, erythropoietin. So erythropoietin is actually stimulated, is actually secreted by the kidneys. If we were to go very high, let's say, um, well, in Trinidad, we don't really have a lot of high mountains, but if you could just imagine, let's say you go, um, you go a mile above sea level, now, the higher up you go, the amount of oxygen decreases. There's just not a much oxygen present. Now, do remember for our normal metabolism for breaking down food and to sustain life, we need a certain volume of oxygen constantly being taken in. So what happens in a case where we go in an environment that does not have a large um, proportion of oxygen in the air that we breathe in. Well, the body, the incredible machine, what it does, it causes the, or let me see, the kidneys of themselves, they secrete erythropoietin. Now there are sensors present in the body, so they will detect a decrease in oxygen coming into the blood. So signal the kidneys to secrete erythropoietin. Erythropoietin travels through the blood, and when it reaches the bone marrow, it signals the bone marrow, hey, we need to 
up your tempo. You need to make more red blood cells. So all that being said, in environments where there's low concentrations of oxygen, our red blood cell production increases. And that is under the control of erythropoietin, which is secreted by the kidneys, very importantly there. So anemia, we've mentioned lack of iron, right? In terms of too few erythrocytes, undersized erythrocytes. And you do have the different types of anemia, but you will not be responsible for them for this course, all right? You just have to know that anemia is a sign of a disease, not the disease itself. And an anemia, in terms of the major um, causative factor for anemia, is lack of iron. That's the major one you have to remember. Okay, so other thing what we're looking at is anemia and polycythemia. Um, we'll only be looking at anemia. Polycythemia is not on the syllabus itself. So normally, this is a showing a normal red blood cell count. Red blood cells present within as a proportion of the plasma. It's 45% and 55% plasma. When you're looking at an anemic condition, you're down to 30% red blood cell, approximately 70% plasma. So that is just showing an abnormal count there. So just take note that in an abnormal count, the red blood cell percentage drops. That is very important to take note of. And here we are seeing um, another condition in which the blood cells have an abnormal shape. And what is this condition known as? Anybody knows? Sickle cell anemia. How you know, how you know sickle cell anemia? So because, the, yeah, it's um, the right here. because it's written right here. Very good. Be but also because of the shape of the red shape blood cells. The yeah, they look like a sickle. Some people might not know what is a sickle. Um, they used it, it particularly is now used mainly in China, certain parts of India and rice growing areas in Africa. Um, they use it to cut rice, it's a manual. A manual way, it's a, a C-shaped knife that they use to cut the rice. Is that what the Grim Rebutters have sir? Yes, yeah, yeah, actually yes. Yeah. Oh, his, his, well, his shoulder, right, so it's a yeah. sickle is this long blade. So of course you'd hardly see it. That's just like how you know you hardly see brushing cutlass anymore because everybody have a waka. So similarly, you don't see a lot of sickles anymore because everybody these days have tractor or you know some other means of, of actually cutting the rice. Uh, right? Or wheat is also used for harvesting wheat as well. Um, but anyhow, but the shape is a sickle shape. For those of us who follow uh, politics as well, you know, the Soviet or the former Soviet Union, um, they had this sickle that was part of their emblem. If you look at the flag of China, you will see it because, you know, one of the things in terms of communism, communal living, they always believe in agriculture, promoting agriculture as a way for the community to rise up. All right, so the sickle, you'd find it on the uh, communist countries, they usually find it on their flags. Okay. So sickle shape, sickle cell anemia. Platelets, very important to control hemorrhaging. Let's see what happens in a case um, of, um, with hemorrhaging, you do have the correction in terms of platelets, it helps stop hemorrhaging. I want to go past this to, sh to look at- um, The question? Yes. Okay, so I was watching the last episode of Grey's Anatomy last night, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. And one of the patients, one of the patients was hemorrhaging. But do you really like when you're bleeding? Do you start to bleed through your nose and your eyes and all of that? It all depends on out? if it if it's capillaries involved. It depends on the nature, the nature of the ailment. So for you to be bleeding through your nose, in terms of bursting the capillaries in your nose, because with those in both your eyes and your nose, you're looking at capillaries. Now capillaries they're very susceptible to bursting because of the fact they are so thin. It's, the cell walls are very thin. Remember in a capillary, they're just one cell thick. So literally one red blood cell at a time passing through. So they're very thin, which is why even, you know, like when you have a cold sometime and you blow your nose too hard, you realize that blood will come out. That's because you burst the um, 
the capillaries in your nose. In a similar way, sometimes if you do have a cold, a cold and you cough a lot and you're coughing hard, you burst the capillaries in your lungs, right? So that's how you'll see blood come out there. So back to answer your question, in terms of bursting the capillaries in your nose and in your eyes, hmm, now what has to be done in terms of for that to happen? <sighs> To be honest, I do not know. I don't know. I'll have to go and I'll have to go and do some specific reading on that. So I don't want to tell you something incorrect. But why it is specifically you get bleeding to the nose and eyes? I know it doesn't happen very often. It's very rare it happens, but it does happen, and I, I just don't know why. All right. So you want to see if you can do some reading and tell us next day why you bleed through your eyes and your nose. But it's only is is specific circumstances. It doesn't happen all the time. Most definitely. But I'm, I'm sure there's some some interesting re reason for it. But thanks for bringing it up. I appreciate that. Okay. All right. Thank so, you, sir. Yes. Um. Go ahead. So when you have Anika? um, mm -hmm. yes, bleeding in your brain. Yeah. Oh. Mm hmm And feel the bleeding in the brain. If you if you feel it. Does the platelets help clot it? When yeah. you have bleeding? No, yeah, yeah, they do in terms in of stopping in the brain. Um, one of the things, so like for instance, if it is you get a concussion, and that's why it's always, and mm -hmm. you will see it in your professional career, sometimes what they literally have to do when they start to get swelling because the inflammatory response occurs, they literally have to crack your skull. And one of yeah. the things, what they do, they will induce a coma um, a medically induced coma in, with the person because what they do, they have to crack the skull and let the swelling go out, swell out the brain and then it after, well, after the swelling has done it goes back down, usually within the space of a couple of days and during that time they will put you into a med medically induced coma right? so it is just something that they do and you will see it, as for head traumas you will see it, I'm sure, in your professional career if somebody does present to the hospital with severe head trauma to the yes, so, so so I saw it my dad recently, but uh -huh. we was asked we wanted to know like if he didn't feel in it in like running in his brain or anything because we asked him and he was like No. Not no. And what he said, no. Yeah. Yeah. As far as I know, there are no pain receptors on your brain. If you when we hmm, would we look at the brain? No, we looked at that in SNF one. But there are no pain receptors. Now, it might sound strange. So for some surgeries that they do on the brain, they keep the person awake, yes? Um, in terms of, let's say for tumors, if they have to remove it from certain areas and they want to ensure, even though they have it mapped out and they know where they're going, they want to ensure that they're not doing damage to surrounding areas, they would have the person um, awake. Now, in a case like that, I'm not a neurologist, so I'm speculating. <laughs> They would have to give local anesthesia, you know, mm -hmm. let's say to the scalp, obviously, because they're going through the scalp, right? And um, but the person is awake. I, I, I've read of that, where they do that kind of surgery because it, they want to ensure that, you know, they don't damage surrounding areas. But as far as I know, on the brain itself, um, there, there are no pain receptors on the brain. So you don't actually oh. feel it. Yeah, which is which strange. Yes, go ahead. So, um, I, I have something interesting to share. So recently, right before the year finished last year, um, yes. I, I have a real good friend, right? But his dad is with construction and so, and um, they went to with construction on on this building, and apparently the neighbors had some real bad dogs, and the dogs started chasing after my partner, my father. So he climbed up this big big wall, and he ended up falling directly over the wall, and the wall was like about fifteen to twenty feet high. And he had a real bad concussion to his head. So um, they rushed him to the hospital and think and blood was coming out through the eye and his ears mm -hmm, and nose mm -hmm, and his mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So they, they keep him there for the night, but mm -hmm. they send him back home. They say nothing was wrong with him. And the next day, up to the next day, I think blood was still coming from his eyes and nose and things. So we call back the ambulance and they, well, they carry him back in the hospital and they say mm -hmm. it's nothing they could do. They can't do no test. They may do no test something on him. So but the blood was still coming. So I guess it's something similar to what we were saying about the capillaries. Is he still That's alive? Cool. He's still alive? 
Yeah, he's still alive. By the grace of God. By the grace yeah. of God. By the grace of God. But that was um yeah, bottom line, that was that was that was very you, they're not supposed to release somebody, especially when they bleed. Yeah, but there's very mm-hmm. little they do when they have um hemorrhage to the brain because I know of an individual who had a stroke and mm-hmm. it was because of a hemorrhage to the brain and mm-hmm. they sent him home in a matter of two days mm-hmm. and say it will heal for itself. Mm-hmm. So I don't know what was... Yeah, well, okay. Once again, um, just to give an objective, I'm not a neurologist. I don't know what is the official. Now, people might do one thing, and you know, you might see it, and so it might have one way, and then it might have the correct way, you know, in terms of how things are being done, right? So, I, I can't speak to that. Do I know any neurologist, boy? And uh, that's, I know a neuroscientist, but I don't know a neurologist. So I don't know why is the egg. I can understand if it's in terms of a stroke. All right, fair enough. But for somebody with a trauma presenting with a head trauma, are they supposed to send them out if you're bleeding from the eyes and nose? I'm not too sure. That that sounds very suspect at best that you'll send a patient at home if they're actually bleeding. That, that doesn't make any sense at all. That makes absolutely no sense. It was more to do. And mm-hmm. the... Uh, yeah, they, they, they keep him from like the daytime from when the incident happened. Mm-hmm. He was there and I had him there for the whole day. And then the evening time, doctors and things end up seeing him and whatever. They didn't ward him or anything like that. Yeah, yeah, and I, I, I would question that. I would, I would question that. that. I would seriously question, yeah, the, um, the, the rationale behind that, that makes absolutely no sense. Uh, the yeah. fact that it wasn't worded, did they do any MRI or any CAT scan or anything like no, that? No, 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 no. They didn't do oh. anything like that. Yeah. My, I, I, my friend was, um, I think they should have taken my carry back stand, though. Mm-hmm. And, um, yeah. Well, I, a couple, but he fought a real hard, and I think that's it. He did strict, mm-hmm. and they, he had this bad, bad concussion, and they tell him that how he needed cigarettes and thing, and a couple days after, he was up screen jolly again out of the bar. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know? I understand, then yeah. He was fortunate. He was fortunate in that regard. But that is a serious thing. As you rightly say, concussions, um, very, very serious things where that, where that is concerned. You know, since you all probably mentioned so many things related to the brain, I'll probably look to see if next day, if I could do a little bit, you know, um, a little set. Well, part of the class, you know, related to the brain to look at bleeding ble- breathing on the bleeding on the brain and things of that nature yeah so next week i'll, I'll talk more to that since everybody since two of you all seem so interested thank okay you, sir. Thank okay, you, sir. okay. Thank you, sir. great thank you. okay all right so let's continue here so the coagulation pathway this is important and take note of it all right in terms of coagulation without this man we would continue to die so will not continue to die, we'll continue to breathe, bleed. And one, there's one uh, rat poison. I don't know if you're familiar with it. They used to have it back in the day in a white bag. It used to be like bread and they used to have a pink, like a pink powder on the bread. Um, Bromelina, I think was the name of the, the trademark. But it, what it has in it is something called warfarin. And you will see warfarin in your professional career. Um, persons who present to the hospital, let's say with heart issues, they will, warfarin is usually the blood, it's a blood thinner. It's a blood thinner of choice, particularly for persons presenting with heart issues, heart complaints. They would give them warfarin because it takes, it, it takes the strain off of the heart. Because remember, blood is viscous. It's not like water. It has a little thickness to it. So uh, they usually would give them a blood thinner such as warfarin. And the reason why warfarin is also used as rat poison is not the most humane thing, but anybody could take, could, could suggest how, how using warfarin as a blood thinner could kill a rat or a mouse? It will allow the inside of the rat or the mouse to bleed out. Yeah, remember these rats and mice, they, they're always squeezing, you know, going through narrow areas. And even ourselves, we might not be aware of it, but on a daily basis, we... Our, we injure ourselves and our body heals itself. We in, heals itself all the time in terms of capillaries, right, within the body itself. Now, if it wasn't for blood clotting, you would be bleed out and you, you would hemorrhage internally and that would be a disastrous thing. So to answer, in terms of with mice, what they do, they give them, they put warfarin in the 
rat poison. And what it does literally, when they're squeezing, going from point A to point B, they're squeezing through a crack internally, right? They do get these breakages in the blood vessels. But the thing is, it will not heal in this, um, in this case, right? So when they, when it doesn't uh, clot, it, your blood will just keep on flowing. And literally these mice, when you do see them, you do see uh, blood running through their eyes and their nose as well. And they, so they die from hemorrhaging, lack of blood, right? So of course, when the blood begins to flow out, the blood pressure will drop. When the blood pressure drop, of course, not sufficient blood getting to all the muscles. Therefore, they wouldn't be able to move around. So they lie down. Of course, the blood is just keep pumping out because they have breakages in the capillary network. So the blood is going out until eventually, da 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 da, they die. Right? So very interesting there. So the coagulation pathway within the body, human body itself, when you do have a break in the skin, you have this protein activated factor seven, right? It's normally inactive, inactive when the skin is whole, but when you do have a breakage, right, is activated. And this activated factor seven causes prothrombin, which is present in the blood. It converts it from prothrombin to thrombin. That is very important. So the activated factor seven, it activates as well active factor X. And this is comes about because of the action of activated factor seven. So activated factor seven, Active causes the activation of uh, factor X. So now it becomes active factor X. Active factor X now acts on prothrombin, converting it to thrombin. Thrombin then acts on fibrinogen, converting it to fibrin. And fibrin looks like a mesh. It looks like a net. And what it does, it traps the red blood cells within it. And this is how a clot is formed, right? So just think about it like a strainer, right? Strainer, the red blood cells, they are like the um, the rice in a in a pot, and now you throw it out in the strainer. And when you throw it out in the strainer, the rice can't get out into the sink, but it stays within the strainer itself. The water goes past, but you know all the rice stays there. And it's a very similar thing. The plasma could go by, but the red blood cells remain in the mesh, the fibrin network, and that's how you have a clot forming. All right, so very important in terms of that clot formation. And the last thing what we want to look at is transfusion compatibility, the red blood cells. All right. How many types of what how many blood groupings do we have? Anybody? Four. How much do we have? Four. Six. Four. Six? Four. Four. Six. Eight. Eight? Oh, I see where you're going. You're thinking about the resource factor. Okay, plus a negative RL. <laughs> I wasn't thinking about that. So those who said four, they weren't thinking about the resource. And the person who said eight, you're thinking about the resource factor, plus and minus. So you're both correct in that regard. All right, so we have A, B, A, B, and O in terms of these different types. Within the, uh, the plasma, you have these antibodies. Now, do remember, in terms of the relationship, Right on the red blood cell, you have antigens. So the antibodies bind to the antigens. If the antibody binds to the antigen, it would cause an attack. So therefore, when you're looking at type A blood, you wouldn't want to have anti-A antibodies because if you had anti-A antibodies, they would bind to the your your own blood, and then it will cause the immune cells of the immune system to come in and destroy it. So you don't want that to happen. However, what they would bind to, let's say somebody were to introduce B type B blood, right? It would bind to the B and then cause the destruction of the B type. So you don't want to have mixing of the blood in terms of the typing, that's very important, right? You don't want to have, because the different types of blood, they have different um, proteins associated with them and they are unique in that regard. And if you do have mixing, it causes something that is called agglutination and it, it could lead to death. If you put in the wrong type of blood, let's say, into a person, and which is why, believe you me, anytime somebody's having a transfusion, be it for surgery or otherwise, always ask the questions and be very careful, even you as a nurse, even you as a, uh, let's say a caregiver, or even if it's happening to you, when they bring the blood, ask the question, make sure they bring the right one. Because every year, and this happens throughout the world, 
people miss, they make mistakes. And how do you think they could make mistakes? One, sometimes in the lab, they label the blood wrong. Or two, you know, the, the, whoever it is, the nurse, nurse practitioner had a long day. And what do they do? They just make a mistake. So they just bring the wrong blood. So, you know, as opposed oh, to type yeah. A positive, they bring B minus, you know. <sighs> Boy, I don't go and sleep, you know, they bring the wrong blood. So always ask the question, whenever you see somebody, if you as an individual, as a patient or a caregiver, Oh, wait, whenever you see blood involved, ask questions. Hey, if it's type A, look at the label and ensure everything is okay without his concern. All right? So that is very, something that's very important. Right? And as uh, one of your colleagues mentioned, you do have the recess plus and, plus and minus. So in terms of the blood types, you have A, B, A, B, and O. And then you have the recess positive and negative. So when you're doing the exercises, as I mentioned, the one dealing with plasma, it will explain this in a little more detail. Plus as well, there's a link there. There's a link which is available on the uh, home page. Let me just show that real quick. All right, so there's a link. Uh, when you look within the lecture itself, but well, there's a specific, right, right here, this link here, it deals with uh, the blood types. So at your leisure, do have a look at it, and it will show you. So that we get positive and negative with type A and B blood as well. Right. So this will right. So at your leisure, you you can have a look at that. Sorry, somebody was asking a question. Go ahead. With type A, B, and O, we get yes. negative and positive as well. Correct. So you have a. A positive, B positive, A B positive, O positive, and A minus, B minus, A B minus, O, mi o minus, in terms of negative. So that's why when, when I asked the question how many blood types there were, some people said four, and they were thinking about A, B, A, B, and O. But then there's also positive and negative for each one of them. So that would really make it eight. Yeah. Excuse me, so this yes. question comes in a exam what do we answer eight or four you can't go wrong saying eight but if you put four you could argue it and get the marks you could just oh. tell them you know so it, it would have to so if i am setting that question i'll have to set it very specifically you know right. to ask you know excluding recess factor you know put that in brackets or something like that okay but it, i would say if, even if you put four you could argue it you know, well, not after the fact, you could just exp try to, you know, talk with the instructor and let them know your trend of thought. And um, you, sh you shouldn't get it wrong because you know the material in that regard. Yeah. Okay, let's just get back to the lecture. Mm -hmm. Right, so this uh, speaks to it. Right, and that is all. Okay, so today what we looked at, we spoke about blood, right, we spoke about the uh, first of all, how blood is actually made in terms of the red blood cells, the major component. We spoke about the components of blood, plasma, and the uh, solid element, or the solid part, or the cellular elements, mainly composed of the red blood cells. We mentioned in the plasma protein that the major protein there is, of course, uh, albumin, and this is a carrier protein. In terms of the red blood cells, Right, and the average person that has five liters, we have approximately 25 trillion red blood cells present in those five liters. And the reason why we have so many red blood cells, it speaks to the importance of the of um, red blood cells to our very existence. And the major reasons why is tied up within the functions of the red blood cells, namely one in terms of carrying and removal of different gases and nutrients, well gases, oxygen and CO2, carrying of nutrients throughout the body, carrying of heat throughout the body, removal of heat when we're thinking about exercising, we have vasodilation and expansion of the blood vessels close to the skin, and then you have loss of heat via conduction and then convection into the atmosphere itself. We looked at some of the diseases associated with blood. We mentioned sickle cell anemia. That is caused by a point mutation. Just one, so that's one amino acid difference causes that change in the shape of the red blood cell from its normal 
biconcave to a sickle cell. And in the sickle cell formation, you have less carriage of oxygen and also pain associated with those red blood cells because they can now stick in the capillaries. So we did mention that as well. We also mentioned the whole process of red blood cell formation and the role of erythropoietin secreted by the kidneys in terms of accelerating red blood cell formation in times of, let's say, if you go a mile high up in a mountain, erythropoietin secreted by the kidneys uh, is detected by the uh, hematopoietic stem cells, the pluripotent hematopoietic stem cells present in your bone marrow, leading to the formation of more red blood cells. So more red blood cells now, they will have a greater chance of extracting more oxygen from the limited amount that is present in the thin air of the high environment. So we mentioned that as well. We also mentioned in terms of the blood typing, A, B, A, B, sorry, A, B, A, B, and O, plus and negative in terms of the recess factors associated with it. And that is very important in terms of uh, the discovery of it by Charles Drew. And you'll read more about that in terms of Charles Drew. Right? So when you look at the um, blood, blood plasma fact sheet, uh, any take home exercise for next day? Right? So when you go through it, it speaks to Charles Drew. This is him here, right? And he was a doctor of science degree. Now, interestingly enough, because he was black, he was not allowed to be a medical doctor, right? Just because of the fact. And in fact, he used to train people to become <laughs> medical doctors, the irony, right? But he himself couldn't be a medical doctor because of the fact that, you know, he was, um, he was black, you know? So that was one of these, these strange things in, uh, in life. But he did a lot of work in terms of our understanding of blood typing. Okay, so we will stop there for today. So for next class day, what you need to do is of course, just finish off, uh, have a look. Well, everybody now has access to the e-classroom, right? So you just need to have a look. Well, uh, material for the next day will be put up, right? It'll be put up in terms of the heart. But for, this, for next class, you just have to finish off this activity sheet and bring it in for next day. We'll discuss it first, and then we'll move on to the heart itself. Okay, any questions? Yes, sir. Go ahead. Yes, Anika. Any lab later? Oh, no. So um, I think I put it on the, in the um, chat. I didn't yes, put it in the chat. Yeah. So lab starts, that's a very good question, Anika. Lab starts next week. It was on the email. Yeah, so it starts next week. Uh, next week we'll start with lab and you'll have activity sheets to do for the lab itself. So we'll speak more about that when we have our first lab next week, okay? Is it, um, so good question. And I'll probably have to send out a poll. Would you all want class to start at eight? Or would want it to start a little later? I'll send out a, a survey monkey poll and we'd see what, what the class says. We'll have to go, everybody has to be comfortable with it. Now, of course it's scheduled from eight to 11, but if it is, you know, you all want a slight change, I am willing to work with you all. But as of now, yeah, we'll revert to the eight to 11 and then the lab 11 to two. Would we go, yeah. So we do that the next, next day. But look out for the survey monkey. I would send it to you. Yes, go ahead, Anika. Is, this a is there a WhatsApp group for this class? Oh, I'm glad you bring that up. Yes, I did yeah. ask, is there one? No. All right, so somebody somebody wants to, um, to start on that one. Could we, could somebody, could I ask somebody to entrust somebody in, in terms of it? 